on the outskirts of Beijing, Olivia Newton-John is on a mission. Embarking on this walk makes me think that we need to um, join together in some kind of ceremony and I thought the best ceremony would be in gratitude. In gratitude for this experience, in gratitude for each other, in gratitude for China, for the wall, for everybody being here and for the opportunity to be able to help so many people who are suffering with cancer all over the world. Olivia's challenge is to lead her walking party almost 250 kilometres across six diverse sections spanning a vast array of country guarded by China's historic Great Wall. I was excited but I was also really nervous to be honest because it was such, such an unknown. I think it attracted like-minded people and everyone was so excited about doing it and it was, a, it was an amazing experience. As well as Olivia's partner, John Easterling, she's invited along a host of her famous friends who'll join her for as much time as they can afford to take out of their busy lives. Friends like Sir Cliff Richard. The invitation from Olivia came to, to do the walk with her and of course I have never found it possible to say no to Olivia. <laughs> Singing star Danny Minogue. I could never have imagined myself trekking across China, but it's one of the best things I've ever done. American TV personality, Lisa Gibbons. This was one of the most profound experiences of my life. I've proved something to myself. I questioned a lot of things about myself. I learned immensely about the world and my place in it. I made incredible friends that have a sharing that's unique. So it, it changed my life. It's really, I mean, this is the coolest thing. I mean, it's one of the wonders of the world, after all. And there was Dee Dee Conn, who played Frenchie to Olivia's Sandy in the film Grease 30 years ago. When I got a call asking if I would walk with her for a wellness center, I said, anywhere, whatever you say. While the celebrities come and go, Olivia's team also includes sporting stars, business folk and ordinary everyday people committed to joining her in making a difference. Olivia has also brought along a unique group of people who walk every step of the way with her. These people she calls Thrivers. Uh, hello, my name's uh, Scott Morrison. I was uh, in August 2001, I was diagnosed with an aggressive form of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I mean, I went there, I mean, I was on a mission for the other cancer survivors and plus the people that didn't make it, you know. My name's Emma Nicholas, I'm 34 and in 2004 I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. You know, with thyroid cancer, it's one of these illnesses that are hitting women in their 30s. I'm not quite sure why. G'day, my name's Gordon Chan, and I was diagnosed with testicular cancer in 2003. So when I did get through it, I, uh, again, the first thing I thought of was, well, how can I help other people get through this thing? My name is Rhonda Martinez, and I was diagnosed with breast cancer in December 2000. I guess we were there to show even people that hadn't been through cancer, that you can just do anything. You, don't, you can't let cancer stop you from doing anything. Olivia's message of empowerment, that's yeah, why we're here. I think we were all in awe of the cancer thrivers and survivors at their heartbeat, at their focus, at their stories, which are amazing. It was like everyone was in the same boat. It was a really great leveler of people. Didn't matter who you were or where you came from or everyone was the same on the wall and in that experience. And a lot of people got to share their journeys in life and what they'd gone through. As the group travels between sections of the wall, Olivia introduces the cancer thrivers to the song she's written to commemorate her mission. It was really 
an amazing experience because you're in a country where you don't speak the language at all. I mean, in Europe, you can kind of get by with a few French words or German words or you can make yourself understood, but most people in China do not speak English. The food is different because Chinese food in China is not like Chinese food in Australia or America or anywhere else. By the end of the first day, it becomes clear that many here will be challenged in more ways than one. Walking, tripping, tripping, hiking, tramping, whatever you call it, from different countries. It's really important if anyone starts to get a hot spot uh, on their foot that they identify. Don't think you're being a wimp because no one else has said anything. At the beginning of the second day, the physical challenge is being taken much more seriously, which is probably just as well. You know, yesterday, there were some steep bits, not unlike a rock ladder. I thought that was steep. Yeah. There's nothing compared with today. Okay. It's a continual climb. It's quite difficult. Everybody's a bit more winded today. The incline is fierce. Which is a lot harder than I thought it would be. <laughs> and we figured it would be a bad message to go backwards. I just sort of keep taking the steps one by one. Everyone focused on the celebrities going over there. When you're there with them, you realise that the celebrities are actually just ordinary people. We're all struggling up the same mountain. We're really impressed with their work. They're really impressed with what we've done, and it was sort of it put everyone on an equal footing. Along the way, all sorts of fears are confronted. We're both feeling very trepidatious. Oh, I can't even say the word. <laughs> we're going to do it because we'd have to conquer our fears and we conquer so many fears and it's like the cancer. It's like going through cancer. When you first start out, it's very scary. But you have to take that first step. So let's liken it to that. And now that she's said that, I can't chicken out. And we're going to be fine at the other end. <laughs> no, I can't do this. All right, go for it. Open your eyes, girl. It was a real nourishing experience that was exhilarating, that was humbling, that was nurturing in a way that I haven't experienced before. We had immediate recognition of each other. There's a vibrational level that was completely in sync. And if your soul has an agenda, I have to wonder, if that page in all of our books was just turned at the same time. Oh, all right. Okay, I'm breathing now. You're breathing now? You do. Oh, you had a ball in my eye. Oh, I did. I'm proud of you. Yeah. <laughs> you made me do it, you sneaky boy. You have to believe we are magic. Nothing can stand in our way. You have to believe we are magic. Olivia insisted each day begin in song. A positive, uplifting state of mind is part of her nature. What's truly amazing is the journey that brought the diminutive star here today began with a diagnosis of breast cancer 15 years ago. At the time, it was very frightening, especially the initial, when you're first told that you have cancer. You know, I think me, probably like a lot of people, you go into denial or you don't really believe it's real. And... Olivia has a sparkle that made her a star. There's something in her that is so beautiful, other than her physical beauty that's inside her. And there was no doubt in her mind when she was diagnosed with cancer that she was going to beat it because she had the most beautiful little daughter and 
There was no question. This is the most amazing experience. It is. This is our third day, right? Yes. And it always sounds weird, but I have to say that I'm really glad I went through that because it made me grow in a lot of ways. Here's what's going on on the Great Wall of China. I never would have done the Great Wall of China. I never would have been doing all the things I'm doing in my life had it not been for that experience. Olivia's unique attitude caught the attention of the people working with cancer at Melbourne's Austin Hospital, where doctors led clinical trials as a part of the Ludwig Institute's global research effort dedicated to finding a cure for cancer. Professor Jonathan Sieben is head of oncology at the hospital. The hospital and the Ludwig Institute have been working together looking at better ways of treating cancer and decided that it was time to build a new cancer centre. And Olivia was approached to see if she could uh, lend her name to this project. And she did so on the condition that we also incorporated wellness as one of the important elements. I, I heard myself say, I'd love to help you if you will include a, a wellness centre, because that was, was always my dream. And um, I also asked my mum, because I felt kind of weird about putting my name on a building. I thought, does it sound really, you know? But she said, if it was going to help other people, then you should do it. It's, it's terribly important to her, and she doesn't come at this from some sort of a theoretical point of view. She comes to it from someone's perspective of a cancer survivor, someone who's been through the journey, who's experienced treatment, who knows the physical and emotional and psychological challenges of going through treatment and recognised, you know, from her own experience, where the needs lie. So much of cancer is an attitude, so much of your healing is how you feel about it and, and the therapy and I was lucky enough to be able to afford when I was going through my cancer treatments I had acupuncture, I had massage, I, I did meditation, Deepak Chopra who I was lucky enough to be introduced to taught me some um, meditation things, I did um, homeopathy and so I was and herbs and things so I was able to afford those things but I had to go outside of the hospital I, did, I couldn't get any of that so I was able to support my my body in those ways and I got through it very well Olivia's ideas were music to the ears of other cancer thrivers who have been forced to face the same demons at the risk of sounding very selfish if it gets if I get it back I need a wellness centre to go to, and why shouldn't we have a wellness centre to go to? It has to be more to, it's not just not about the treatment of cancer. There has to be follow-up, it has to be about, there has to be something spiritual for people to, to be able to go to and find themselves again. Patients are people who have needs and who suffer and who need to be cared for. Um, the wellness centre will provide something which is going to be terribly important in their lives, something which will nurture that aspect of them which a cancer treatment um, will not necessarily address. It's Olivia's take on wellness that also attracted her team to come and join her. I just agree with her vision that she's got of making a cancer and wellness centre. Um, I've watched many friends be treated uh, for cancer and I've got kind of a, a good experience to, to understand that the wellness side has got to be added to the medical treatment and I think it's exciting. And if you need a helping hand, I'm going to be right here with you. I'm going to choreography. Yeah. You're not alone. I've been there well, my first reaction was no, no, <laughs> I don't want to go to China. But when I found out more about the cause, and particularly when I found out of the philosophy of the hospital, I had to be there. To have a place within that environment that you can be healed or feel you're being taken care of and nurtured and learn about cancer and talk to other women and, you know, like the wellness centre will be and hopefully we'll have some adjunctive therapies to help people through the treatments. That is my dream, and it's coming true, and it's just an amazing thing. The other thing that is really important to do is acknowledge our new guests who arrived Yay. today. For the next section of the walk, some newly arrived celebrities and a new location. 
my mod this way, this way for a second. That's it. Perfect. The walkers have been transported to the other side of the country, near the Mongolian border, and they begin by being introduced to some of the local food. In order to reduce the smell, we need uh, some garlic. Oh my goodness! Great! <laughs> 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 After dinner, they're treated to some local entertainment. The next morning, it's back to reality in the form of the Gobi Desert. On these windswept plains, the weather has battered the Great Wall into a pile of rubble in many places. As usual, thriver Scott Morrison led the way, setting the pace for the newcomers. No, I said if anyone fell or needed help, I'd stop and help you. Help you. And if you need to be carried, I'd more than I'd try and carry them. The yeah, I'm finding this real easy at the moment. You're looking for more of a challenge? Uh, yeah, no, I am, but um, I think we need a day's where it's easier so we can recharge our batteries the for the hard the part. Yeah. Uh -huh. My wife, we cry to each other on the phone every day because we both love each other and, and I'm sad. This is the only part that I'm sad doing this trip because yeah. I'm not home with, with the family. For me it was, it was a marker, it was just a point where I could stop and breathe and work out what I was going to do to make sense of cancer and, and, and what my personal experiences have been with it. As well as hearing the stories of the thrivers, the newcomers are introduced to the mysteries of the red tent. Can you believe it? The toilet just blew over. We're in the middle of the desert. We've been following this red tent for like an hour. With all these poor women wanting to go to the toilet and it just exploded. Was anybody in there? There was no one in there. I was just in there. That could have been me on that little toilet right there. Look at that truck. The red tent. That was a bonus. That was... The red tent was a little, I think it was like an icebreaker. It was a way of getting us all to know each other a little faster than we would have otherwise. <laughs> Someone that set up this tent and it was very clean and very nice and it ended up being a red tent. It was apparently an accident, but I was thrilled because you could, you could see it for miles and the red tent became kind of <laughs> like the, the next target for, you know, how far you could go. Anyway. If you've never traveled through the desert with a bunch of people you don't know and had, had to share a non-flushing toilet, then you've never really lived. As the team traverses the Gobi's endless horizon, they have plenty of time to contemplate why they're here. The next morning, as the group prepares to set off, John Easterling drops a bombshell. In her, in her state, and so I just talked to him, and so they're kind of calling the family together uh, right now. So <clears throat> I won't be able to be with you the rest of the journey. I'll be headed back, I think, late this afternoon to uh, support my brother 
And uh, so that just d shows the urgency and the importance, you know, of what we're all about and what we're doing here. And we'll see you next time. It's very difficult to leave, but at the same time, I know that my place, you know, right now is supporting my brother and, uh, and the family. You know, that we'll... It felt like a really lonely spot, the furthest away you could have possibly got from Beijing. And um, for me, it was like I was really torn. I talked to John about it and I said, you know, I really feel lonely. He felt that I should stay and I felt sure that I should stay, but I felt really bad that he had to leave by himself. With cancer. I came back to, uh, to North Carolina and it was a three day journey getting back and when I got back, I was able to see my sister-in-law uh, for half an hour and she passed away uh, half an hour after I had gotten back. You have to believe we are magic. Nothing can stand in our way. Nothing can stand in our way. So the next few days were really difficult. They were very lonely days and I was really torn. That was part of my journey. It was part of what I had to go through. I needed to. John had been such a great support for me in that first week that this was my real test to see if I could do it without that support. Another region of the country, another surprise. They have no idea where they're going, but find themselves in a television station. We're ushered in, and I'm, flowers are put in my hand, and I'm ushered into this room, and they're all speaking Chinese, and we sit down, and they say, yeah, there's a television show going on, and you're going to be not just watching it, you are it. And I go, what do you mean you are it? He said, well, you're part of the show, and it's a fundraiser for the thing, and and you're going to make a speech, and someone hands me something to say, and I'm like, boy, what is going on here? What's going on is a live television program paid for by the provincial Shaanxi government so that the Chinese people can donate to Olivia's cause. And there's dancing people and 30 children in beautiful costumes singing a song for us, and they're fundraising, and then they bring out checks as donations for the hospital. These are all local people who know nothing about Australia or the hospital. Or, and it was just, it was kind of an um, unbelievably emotional thing. This is the great work to Beijing 2008, anti-cancer donation evening. You could say that Olivia broke Chinese historical record. That so far, this is the first time ever during the communist regime uh, that um, Chinese people personally donated money for foreign charity outside Ch uh, China. Hu is the goodwill ambassador for the Chinese Breast Cancer Association, who enlisted the Shaanxi government. the people and I was I was I, I was brought into the magic with everyone else I mean it was the selfless people that wanted to walk 29 days or 28 days nobody in China would do that no no star maybe half an hour or five hours but five hours is already pushing it and the fact that they just gave up personal creature comforts and go to a country they don't know eat completely foreign food and 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 walk those harsh conditions to demonstrate the pain and suffering they went through, that's an incredible metaphor, and, and we have never seen that ever before in China. Dr. Jeff Rabi, our ambassador in China, was also impressed. China doesn't have the same tradition of uh, charity and uh, non-government organizations that we have uh, in the West. And I was quite struck by how the Chinese uh, came out and rallied uh, in support of the, uh, of the uh, awareness campaign and the fundraising. And certainly the Shaanxi section in uh, a very poor part of China, in central China, um, rallied to provide uh, funds and support the uh, walk. And this is very new uh, for China. In Shaanxi province, yet more celebrities have taken to the trail. 
The heat of the desert is long forgotten. The weather is now turning cold and Olivia is struggling. I was coughing and I had a fever and a sore throat, but I, I knew I had to... I was the leader, there was no way I couldn't... I couldn't take a day off. Other people took days off, but I knew I had to keep going. What I thought was amazing is that she actually started and finished and sustained uh, tremendous enthusiasm throughout some very difficult uh, periods of walking. It just shows how incredibly dedicated she is to this cause. And we'd walk miles and miles and miles and uphill and we'd get to this flat field and they're these cutest little individually coloured tents, all really close to each other. Look at that. Oh, City, I love it. They were obviously terribly intrigued as to why all of us would be, you know, staying in tents in, their, in the outskirts of their village. I think the locals provided dinner for us and they did a barbecue and we lit this big bonfire. That's one of my most vivid memories is that is that night in that tent of being freezing. <laughs> it was great though. Every step is the same whether in the sunshine or in if you can hold on, <laughs> even through the pain, show up tomorrow, do it all again. As Olivia reaches her personal low point, the group makes a discovery in the snow that lifts her spirits. And it was a kitten. And it was weeny. It was like about the size of my hand and soaking wet. It was mewing. And it was freezing, it was snowing, it was wet. And I put it under my shirt and was determined that I was going to save this little being. So this little kitten kind of became my, my companion and my, I don't know, I became really, really attached. It was like a spiritual connection with this little kitten. It was almost like he was surviving, we were all surviving. He represented something really important to me and to everybody else, I think. <laughs> Your lips. See, look in these lips. Don't give up. Here I am. And if you need a helping hand, I'm gonna be right here with you. Let's make magic. Austin Ludwig. <laughs> He's our mascot. Yeah. He's strong, though. Yeah, she was walking around with this little kitten, and I'm thinking, what, what, where was that? She said, oh, we found it. Somebody must have thrown it in a little lake or something. One of the guys waded out and got it. And it was interesting because that little kitten became like a symbol for what we were doing, trying to keep people alive. And, and she nursed that thing. I mean, it had no hair when, it, when she first found it, but it grew fur. Just as the walkers are lagging after 18 days on the track, an influx of newcomers boosts their spirits. <laughs> this is amazing. American comedian Joan Rivers brought her unique humour for a very short visit to the wall. Where's Olivia? She being carried? I can't see Olivia. Actually, I didn't realise that we were going to walk the wall. When she called me, she said, I thought she said we're going to walk the Great Mall of China. So I came with a lot of credit cards and just ready to have a good time. And unfortunately, it turned out to be the wall, not the mall. Here's Olivia. I can't believe it. You got your heels on. I think it's important to bring a little style to the wall. <laughs> I've been exercising strenuously. Every day I make sure that my breasts touch my toes. I just take off my bra. It's like a lesbian prison.
prison. <laughs> it looks like a lesbian prison. <laughs> I mean, you could escape if you really wanted to. A man could get out of it like this. After barely an hour, Joan calls it a day. Yeah. You again? Yeah, that's good. Thank you. You ain't fighting for this. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah. As the newcomers took to their walking with enthusiasm, some of the thrivers were finding it tough going. You know, walking up and down the wall gives you time to think, and to me it was similar to actually having the cancer treatment. There was a lot of peaks and troughs, and cancer treatment was similar, but I always knew there was an end point. Each day that we walked that wall, there was an end point. I'd cry in my room, thinking I just want to go home. And the thought of getting up some mornings you know, at 5.30, 6 o'clock and doing it all again. I think we had three days off in the whole four weeks. Um, it was very depressing at times. But you just had to do it, and it was exactly the same with chemo. You just had to go through it. Yeah, I miss the family, don't worry about that. Yeah. Yeah, the wife and the two boys and me. Uh, Scott Morrison was missing his family too. For days, he talked often about his wife. What he didn't know oh. is she was about to make a surprise visit. Like some shining I can't love. believe I'm here right now. It's just amazing. What are you going to do when you get home? Uh, it's a Thursday night. I'll be home. Uh, take it easy. The wife for a little bit. Yeah. My heart is beating that hard. <laughs> now, Ronnie passed away from cancer. Oh, here she is here. Yeah, you're kidding. <laughs> no, I couldn't remember you, you bastard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so proud of you, I'll tell you. Oh. oh, you're an inspiration to so many people. Can you believe I'm here? No, I'm trying to ring you. I thought the heart for me at the time was um, my wife. A surprise visit. That was a great su surprise, and it was a shock to oh. me. And it was a highlight. Uh, no, I love my wife. I had no idea what a gift to me this whole experience was going to be. I lost both my parents within four months of each other to cancer. And this only happened four years ago. And I didn't join any kind of support group. I have lovely friends and family, but it was locked in me. Each time members of the team got down, it was the power of the group that pulled them through. We were all in a foreign country, extre extremely foreign for most people. And we built up a sort of relationship that I think has bonded us for a long time. And I think people are really committed. I know there's people are busy in their lives, but this has made people committed to the cause. Doing? Good. The latest arrival is the torpedo. His luggage is lost, so he has to tackle the wall in his socks. One of those things that, that happen. You know when you're told to put all the stuff you really need in your carry-on? Yeah, I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you might be doing this the Aussie way, in thongs? In thongs, barefoot, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> so he, he walked the hardest leg of this trip with no shoes. Two pairs of socks. I said, Ian, what is this? Is it because you had to get in a cold swimming pool every morning that, that you're used to torture? I mean, <laughs> but he did it and he, he thrived and he got through it. Thorpey's feet paid the price the next day, but he soldiered on. 
obviously my feet are feeling a little sorry for themselves today with you know, kind of some really deep bruising. The enthusiasm of the group is now reaching a crescendo and despite very steep gradients, the last leg of the journey seems to fly. Well, coming down the wall was probably the happiest time for me. Unlike a lot of other people who were, you know, very emotional and crying, I couldn't wait to get through that red ribbon. When we finally came around the corner and it was the last hundred yards of the walk, you could feel it mounting. I didn't realise I was going to be emotional, but I just, all this, all these feelings and emotions of, of all those weeks of walking um, and the exhaustion and the exhilaration and knowing that we'd, we'd accomplished it all came up and we were all crying and hugging each other and you know you see them in sports games and things with people but I've never really been a part of a group like that or a team we're a team but there was a unbelievable feeling of, of, of uh, success you know that we had done something truly positive People would ask me, how was it? And I'd say, you know, it still makes me emotional. I can't tell you. Isn't that amazing? Hang on. Olivia had completed her walking mission and in the process raised millions of dollars towards the building of her wellness center to change the way the world treats cancer. But to get the job finished, to get the Cancer and Wellness Centre actually built, she will need millions more. Once I make a commitment to something, I, I see it through. And um, I really feel that this uh, wellness centre will benefit a lot of people. And I, I'm hoping that this concept will be taken around the world. Around a month after Scott Morrison returned from the walk, his 19-year-old son, Daniel, was diagnosed with cancer. At first, I didn't want to believe it. I mean, even when he sort of complained he had lumps, I, said, I didn't even take time out to pay attention to him. I just thought he was, I don't know, just, he was at that age, I didn't think he wanted, you know, Monday mornings, I'm tired, I can't go to work. You, know, you got a half of a lump, and I never took time out to feel, feel his body until it was too late, until he got diagnosed. Then I felt his lumps, and I thought, you oh, no, dickhead, I should have been onto it. Clearly, Olivia's mission goes on. And I just hope if anybody's watching this that, you know, the, the donations that came in, those donations don't have to stop because the walk stopped. And you know why? Because, the, because cancer continues. The centre is a dream. Uh, the dream costs money and we still have some way to go. We're raising that money and we will raise it, um, but it's going to take a little while longer yet. Uh, but when we do have the money, we're going to have something which we build, which is going to be something really special. All of the people who joined the walk are now committed to the cause and have joined Olivia in the crusade to raise more money. Danny Minogue is now also an ambassador for the Cancer and Wellness Centre. This is why I wanted to see it through. I couldn't do the walk and then leave. I had to, to be a part of seeing this happen and, and come together and and it's it's all a work in progress like um, medicine changes the, the wellness part will also evolve as they return to their normal lives they all realize they're involved in something very special and apparently little seeds planted here in China keep bearing new fruit 
I'm extraordinarily proud of her. Olivia and John got married and are ready to continue her mission together. <laughs> We're going to work on it, aren't we? <laughs> you bet. I think we were all changed by it. I don't think you can have a relationship with that many people that's so intimate and so purpose-driven and not have it change you. Little things don't worry me as much anymore. You know, um, I'm a, quite a keen golfer and my golfing buddies will tell you that uh, it doesn't matter if it's raining, I just say it's water. You get wet, you're dry again, you know, so what? It changed me in a lot of ways. I, it made me more resilient and determined that, you know, that if, if you have to do something, you just need to do it. Even now I find people look at me, sometimes they talk to me and their eyes go straight to my scar. And it's an odd thing. I'm not quite sure why, because I didn't actually think it was that visible. But now I think I feel I'm, more pr I'm just more proud of it, more confident about showing it. Emma and Brendan are now proud parents. I don't know, maybe it was just, you know, the positivity from the trip that I carried back with me helped that. So yeah, now I'm nearly five months pregnant. The kind of people that show up for things like this are people who already have made a choice to stand and deliver in their lives at some point. But when you come together, I think it just allows each of us to be lifted higher than we thought we could go. Sometimes there is not a rhyme or reason So you search for something to believe me the dance and the answer to living is love Don't give in, don't give up Here I am And if you need a helping hand I'm gonna be right here with you If you need a helping